Sinston has known that his survival on Earth is upon the rising of the sun. For the sun gives him light and warmth. It grows him. It provides sustenance, too, for the domestic animals that nourish him. Once, man worshipped the sun as a god. Today, through a telescope, during a total eclipse, he can know the sun for what it is. A burning star 93 million miles from Earth. A raging holocaust of fiery matter, almost a million miles in diameter. Explosions vast beyond imagining roar up from its surface to shoot flaming gas for hundreds of thousands of miles into outer space. But even before the telescope, man knew that the sun could be a destroyer as well as a giver of life. It has turned whole areas of his planet's surface into arid desert. It can dry up streams and rivers, kill crops, cause famines. It can kill man, too. Overexposure to the sun's rays can cause sunstroke, heat prostration, and even death. The sun can foster life or destroy life. In itself, it is neither good nor bad. It merely exists. The atom bomb has led some men to think of atomic energy as something only destructive. But like the sun, atomic energy is neither good nor bad. It merely exists. Man's earth and everything on it, people, chairs, tables, are made up of atoms, and every atom contains atomic energy. An atom is held together by electrical force. In the center or nucleus, there are particles with positive charges called protons. Around the nucleus revolve particles with negative charges called electrons. Also in the nucleus, there are very important particles with no electrical charge at all. These are called neutrons. In addition, the whole atom is held together by a kind of binding force or cosmic glue. Atoms of different elements, such as gold or oxygen, have different numbers of these particles in their nuclei. Hydrogen, for example, has a one proton, or positive electrical charge, and so scientists have given him an atomic number of one. Oxygen is heavier, he has eight protons, and so his atomic number is eight. Gold, still heavier, is rich with 79 protons, and uranium, heaviest of all the natural elements, has 92. Each element, or family of atoms, can have different members called isotopes. Each isotope has the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. Some elements, like tin, have many isotopes. Others, like aluminum, have only one. They are called stable. Still others are called unstable, they are busy day and night being what science calls radioactive, like radium, which throws off powerful rays along with some of its own. Bring a neutron at a uranium nucleus. The result was nuclear fission. But a double miracle happened when the atom split into two. The first concerns that binding force or cosmic glue that holds the atom together. It has a kind of weight all its own. But the two atoms that result from the splitting of one have binding force too, and a little less of it is needed to hold them together. Some is left over. What happens to it? It explodes as energy, proving Einstein's theory that mass and energy are really the same. Now for the second miracle. When a single particle starts the reaction, splitting the uranium atom, energy is released as heat and blast, while powerful rays similar to X-rays are given off. 
But something else important happens. Free neutrons are driven out with tremendous speed. Neutrons, those little particles that split the atom to begin with. If enough uranium-235 happens to be present, those neutrons in turn bombard other uranium atoms, causing them to split and to split still others. The result? A chain reaction. Over a million, billion, billion atoms exploding in two seconds. But in an atomic pile, this chain reaction can be slowed down. Here at Oak Ridge, atom splitting is taking place. But it is retarded and completely under man's control. And man can make an atomic pile, also called a nuclear reactor, work for peace, not war. He can expose many kinds of chemicals to the neutron activity of an atomic pile and make them radioactive. These substances are called radioisotopes and they are opening new horizons in research for man's benefit in agriculture, industry, and in medicine. In a hospital where radioisotopes are already being used, a doctor explains to some student nurses just what a radioisotope is, a substance which has become radioactive through exposure to the neutrons of an atomic pile. The doctor has two bottles of iodine. One is radioactive, the other is not. They both look the same and have the same medical properties. But the radioactive iodine has begun to give off invisible rays, similar to X-rays. Invisible though they are, they can be detected by a sensitive instrument called a Geiger counter. As the rays hit the counter, they register with a clicking noise. The rays also register on the counter dial, swinging it to the right if radiation is present. First, the doctor places the counter over the ordinary iodine. There are no clicks and no reaction. But when the counter is placed over the radioactive iodine, called radioiodine, the clicks begin, showing that rays are present. The amount of radiation is registered by the needle of the dial. These rays, like the sun's rays, can be dangerous if the human body is overexposed to them. Some, like the gamma ray, can penetrate cardboard very easily, and also human flesh. Here, the rays penetrate the cardboard and register. One of nature's elements, ordinary lead, has the ability to stop most of the rays. Here, they are not able to reach the Geiger counter, and no radiation is registered. For this reason, all radioactive substances are kept in containers made of lead or other impenetrable material. A nurse asks whether radioisotopes stay radioactive permanently. The doctor explains that each one has a different length of life, from a millionth of a second to one and a half billion years. Now let us go back to the atomic pile at Oak Ridge and see how these radioisotopes are made. This technician is preparing ordinary baking soda for irradiation in the pile. It will become radioactive and give off invisible rays. In this form, it can become immensely valuable for research. This is the isotope face of the atomic pile. Here, substances are exposed to neutron activity and are made radioactive. The process is continuous. Materials already irradiated are removed from the graphite stringers and new materials to be irradiated are inserted. The newly produced radioisotopes are now giving off rays and are stored temporarily in a lead safe. A Geiger counter measures the radiation present so that the health of the operators is not endangered by overexposure. Later, the radioisotopes are stored in a special building called the Atomic Apothecary. Apparatus for the handling and storing of radioactive materials has been specially designed so that operators are subject to a minimum of exposure. One direct exposure to these substances would probably not be dangerous, but frequent exposure is. Radiation effects are cumulative, that is, Successive exposures build up within the body. 
Therefore, people who work daily with radioactive substances must be protected. Many thousands of shipments of radioisotopes have been made from this building to many kinds of organizations, to hospitals and medical research laboratories, to centers for agricultural experimentation and to industry, not only in the United States, but in 53 other nations. Let us look now at some specific ways in which radioisotopes have already been used for mankind's benefit. Foremost is their use in medical research and diagnosis. For example, in diagnosing diseases of the thyroid gland, doctors have found radioiodine to be highly effective. Before examination, the patient drinks a solution of radioiodine, which, like ordinary iodine, is quickly absorbed from the bloodstream into the thyroid gland. By using a type of Geiger counter to measure the radiation coming from the region near the throat where the gland is located, the doctor can determine whether it is functioning normally. Radioisotopes offer almost limitless possibilities for medical research on a wide variety of diseases. At Oak Ridge Cancer Hospital, research is concentrated on the most mysterious and dreaded disease of our times. Scientists have called radioisotopes the greatest aid to medical research since the microscope. And so the atom which helped create the most terrible weapon in the history of warfare may tomorrow help eliminate one of man's most terrible peacetime killers. Next to disease, our world's greatest problem is the production of sufficient food for all people everywhere. More than one billion of our Earth's people do not have enough food to maintain health. Poor crops and undernourished livestock bring illness and famine in their wake. Radioisotopes are opening a whole new field for the study of plant and livestock nutrition. In agricultural research laboratories, it is now possible to learn exactly what elements are needed for the growth of a specific crop, how much of each, and at what stages of growth certain elements should be supplied. In sealed greenhouses, plants can be grown with complete control over temperature, moisture, sunlight, and nutrients. In this experiment, soybeans will be grown in an atmosphere of radioactive carbon dioxide pumped into the chamber. When the soybean plants have grown, the scientist harvests his radioactive crop. Such agricultural research helps man to learn more about the effects of radiation on his living environment. More about the basic nature of the food plants so vital to his agricultural economy. Experiments have been done with many of the elements used by plants for food. The important discovery has been that fertilizers used by farmers have often been wasted because their ingredients were useless to the plants of a particular crop. Knowledge like this will enable farmers to produce more food per acre of arable land. More wheat, more food, a healthier and happier world. And atomic energy can help to bring it closer. In industry too, the atom has already gone to work for peace. In the oil industry, the ability of the radioisotope to serve as a tracer is saving money and time. Oil producers, for example, have the problem of identifying each different batch of oil pumped from an oil field. A small amount of a radioisotope is added to the head of each new batch of crude oil as it leaves the field. Pumps force the oil through pipes to the refinery, where a counter detects the rays from the radioisotope as soon as the new batch arrives. Automatically, a light flashes at refinery headquarters. This takes the place of former tips that were both costly and time-consuming. Although it is not expected that radioactive materials will revolutionize industry, the ability of a radioisotope to act as a tracer makes it invaluable in techniques of testing products for higher levels of quality. In the field of industrial and chemical research, particularly with synthetics, 
its contribution is already important. But perhaps the greatest promise of atomic energy is power itself, power for peace and productivity. Nuclear physicists are at work in the United States and in many countries seeking practical ways of harnessing the energy within the atom to work peacefully for man. The atom, unlike power from water and fuels, can bring its energy to those areas of the world which until now have been starved for electricity and fuel. Developed in the United States, the world's first atomic power plant produced usable electricity from a nuclear reactor in 1951. It still operates today in the western state of Idaho, a forerunner of full-scale atomic power stations. There are still adequate stores of natural fuels like coal, but how long will they last with the expanding needs of modern civilization? It is estimated that by 1975, the world need for all fuels will be twice that of 1950. Scientists realize that at this rate, fuel needs may outrun nature's supply of oil and coal in the not too distant future there is two million times more energy in a lump of uranium than in a lump of coal. But so far, scientists have unlocked only a very small portion of the energy inside. When the uranium atom is split, only a tiny fraction of its atomic energy is released. The energy is there. The problem is to get it out more efficiently and to use it for the betterment not of one nation, but of all nations everywhere. President Eisenhower, in his address to the United Nations on December 8, 1953, said, The United States knows that peaceful power from atomic energy is no dream of the future. That capability already proved is here. Now, today, the entire body of the world's scientists and engineers had adequate amounts of fissionable material with which to test and develop their ideas that this capability would rapidly be transformed into universal, efficient, and economic usage. The president proposed the founding of an international atomic agency to which all the nations of our world would belong. Six months later, in June 1954, at the University of Michigan in the United States, an international conference of nuclear physicists was held. Scientists from 17 nations gathered together. Their purpose was to exchange ideas and information about their work. They talked a language that knew no boundaries of nation nor of color. They had a common interest in the atom and its peaceful power, and in the future and survival of a race called simply man. On December 4, 1954, a resolution endorsing President Eisenhower's proposal for the setting up of an international atomic energy agency received the unanimous approval of the United Nations General Assembly. This resolution included plans for the holding of an international conference of nuclear physicists on the development of the peacetime uses of atomic energy. And so, men everywhere have moved to join President Eisenhower in the pledge he made to the United Nations on that December day in 1953. United States pledges before you, and therefore before the world, its determination to help solve the fearful atomic dilemma, to devote its entire heart and mind to find the way by which the miraculous inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. Hi, everybody. I'm Skip Alzheimer. Welcome to the AV Geeks Lunchtime Streaming Show. Um, hope everybody had a good weekend and uh, enjoyed Friday's screening of Rock, It's Your Decision. Uh... A wonderful, well, let's see, wonderful uh, film about the evils of rock and roll. 
and the dilemmas that um, teenagers face in the late 70s, early 80s when it comes to rock music. Um, so we just watched uh, Atoms for Peace in Introducing the Atom. And it has some animation that shows up in another film I have called A is for Atom, which I have in color. And I love those big Atom, you know, headed little people that dance, like in, in Radium 88, there's like this dancing around and this hopping and bouncing around. It's, it's really quite a wonderful explanation. There's a better one I found in um, <coughs> Our Friend the Atom, which is a Disney film, which basically talks about a chain reaction where they there's a, a room full of set uh, mousetraps and a ping pong ball. They drop ping pong balls and they set off a mousetrap and they bounce to another mousetrap and boom, 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 boom. It's wonderful. I'd love to show it to you, but Disney. Disney, Disney, Disney. Um, they would bring the... Uh, Mousetrap down on me, quite literally, the mousetrap. Um, coincidentally, that film that we just saw talked about Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and I am wearing an Oak Ridge Laboratory... Uh, wait. Um, National Laboratory shirt that a friend of mine gave me. He worked there a couple of years ago uh, because they also, besides having a breeder reactor and other types of t uh, atomic test facilities, they have a giant supercomputer that he was using for forestry purposes. Um, and so uh, I said, man, I'd love to get a shirt from Oak Ridge. And I like that it looks like a, like a, a national park. It's like, oh, it's Oak Ridge. <laughs> Here's these crazy reactors that are there. Um, anyways, uh, so many films to watch, so many films. Um, this next one is uh, a wonderful film from the 70s made by Encyclopedia Britannica. Well, this could be late 60s. I'll have to watch. We'll have to look for the copyright notice and see. So here's Who Needs Rules. <laughs> do is directed by rules. Rules help us get along better and safer together. What would happen if there were no rules for drinking? Could you imagine playing softball if there were no rules, none at all? Could you even play softball if there were no rules? Rules are necessary in order to tell you what to do and to tell others what to expect from you. There are rules for young people, rules for adults, Even rules for people who make the rules. Sometimes rules conflict with what we want and what we believe. That's where you get this one. Great, now you've lost it. No, I haven't. I'll find it. I wonder where it went. If you only know how to throw a frisbee. Well, I threw it in this area. It should be around here someplace. Boy, if we don't find it. Uh, da -da -da. It's your fault. You put it on there. Here it is, Connie. I found it. Hey, Connie, come here a minute. I wonder whose dog he is. He looks like he's starving. You know what? 
I bet he doesn't have a home. Nah. He must belong to somebody. I bet not. Nobody bring him to the park without a collar and leash. It's against the rules. So what? Maybe he ran away. No, nah, look how skinny he is. I bet he hasn't had any food in days. Have you, fella? You know what? It'd be neat if we could take him home and keep him. Are you kidding? You know they don't allow pets in our building. Well, I know. But still. Yeah, well. Come on, Mama have lunch ready for you soon. Okay, Steve, that's it. He really has to go home now. But how can he? He hasn't got any home. Well, he can't come with us, that's for sure. We'd all get in trouble. Hey, listen. What if we put him in that old storage room? Nobody ever goes in there. It's still the building. It'd be the same as if we kept him in our apartment. I don't mean for always. Just for this afternoon. Then we could at least give him something before we let him go. Gee, I don't know, Steve. Come on, Tony, look how hungry he is. Wow, look at him eat. I wonder how long since it's been since he's ate. How long since you ate, Pooch? His name's not Pooch. It's Frisky. How do you know? Because that's what I decided to name him. Now, wait a second, Steve. I like him, too. But we just can't keep him, and that's that. You know the rules against keeping pets in our building as well as I do. I've been thinking, Connie. What if we hide Frisky's box way behind those old trunks and then bring him food and stuff? Then nobody'd ever find out about him. Not even Mom and Dad. It's not Mom and Dad I'm worried about. It's the manager. What if the dog starts barking in the middle of the night and wakes everybody up? How people like that? We could train him not to bark. Oh, sure we could. Look, Steve, we just can't. You know how much trouble Dad had to find an apartment that didn't cost a fortune? Yeah. So do you want to get Dad in trouble with the manager? Get everybody mad at us? Maybe even get us kicked out of here? No, but do you want the dog catcher to catch Frisky and take him to the pound? Because you know what they do to stray dogs in the pound. Is that what you want? No, but I think... No, that... I can't take care of them all by myself. But if you help, we can do it. At least for the summer. Come on, Connie. Do we try it or not? What should Steve and Connie do? Why does the apartment have a rule against pets? Do Steve and Connie have a right to break that rule? right to be here as you have. Well, quit bugging me. Yeah. All right, Craig, I told you to leave me alone. Oh, come on, man. I just want to play a little basketball. Great. Why don't you? Okay, give me the ball. Oh, no. If you want to play, get your own ball. This one's checked out to me. But I like this one. Make me. 
things are so tough, huh? Cut that out. I'm warning you. Hey, quit that. Okay, let's break it up. Come on, get up. Come on, let's go. Get up. All I was doing was playing a little basketball over there, and he had to come back in and no, kick all the ball no, out. I, I just wanted to play basketball, but he was hogging a ball, and so I never got a chance, so I went out. I don't it. care if Craig did start it, Billy. You were fighting, too, and you know you're not supposed to. I had to defend myself, didn't I? No, you could have reported him to me or one of the teachers. Oh, sure, and have everybody call me a chicken. Then Craig and the guys he hangs around us, they'd be picking on me all the time. Look, Billy, we have a rule against fighting, and you're just going to have to obey that rule, period. Maybe that's your rule, but it's not my dad's. He always tells me don't ever take anything from anyone. He says the more you let people push you around, the worse everything will be for you. Do you know why we have our rule, Billy? So people won't get hurt. Well, yes, that's a great part of it, but that rule's there to protect the smaller kids and the weaker kids from bullies. Now, maybe you can handle Craig, but what about the kids who aren't able to if we don't help them? Huh? So when you're in school, Billy, you obey our rules and you let us handle situations like this. But what if Craig jumps me someplace else? If he thinks I'm a chicken here, he'll think I'm a chicken everywhere. Look, Mr. Zepeda, if I don't take care of myself right here, right now, I'm in big trouble. What should Billy have done when Craig took the ball away? Does the school have a right to tell Billy not to fight back if someone picks on him? Whose rule should Billy obey? The school's or his father's? I love the uh, stop the projector films um, because they don't have necessarily an answer and they pose these questions and we're, as students we're supposed to sit and talk about it. But that whole thing about, yeah, well, we're sure that you could beat up that other kid, but what about the smaller kids? It's like, no, it's more about like, no, we don't want kids fighting on our property and that's the rule. <laughs> we don't want to be liable for if somebody gets hurt. And it, that is not a way that we solve problems. I don't know. Anyways. Uh, so I wanted to mention a couple of things. <coughs> One, thank you for buying coffee. Coffee is always a great way uh, at AV Geeks for us to uh, wake up and do the things that we need to do. Uh, including pulling films and showing them to you. Uh, also liking um, and subscribing. Uh, but I have an event coming up on Saturday uh, in conjunction with the uh, Houston's 1940 Air Terminal Museum. It's a really awesome place if you live in the Houston area to visit uh, when there's not a pandemic. Uh, and even it's a cool place to visit when uh, you're flying through the Southwest Terminal in uh, Houston um, because it's right on the other side of the, the landing strips. Uh, I've done a couple of shows there where they flew me in, and uh, we showed old films about uh, air travel, commercial air travel, and people who go to the museum are often people who work in that industry, uh, and so we're going to do a virtual screening event. It's, I think it's 15 bucks, but the money goes towards keeping the museum going, which is an awesome space because it's in a 1940 air terminal, so you get to see what it looked like and how small it was and the whole thing about driving on to the landing strip and all that stuff is stuff that was happening back then. Um, they have a lot of memorabilia and things like that. So uh, I'm putting in the comments a link uh, so you can buy tickets and it'll be like a Zoom thing. And I'm trying to figure out a way to do make it into a game too. So we'll figure that out too. We might have bingo, air terminal bingo 
Um, but here, so here's the link. Um, anyways, I'll be advertising that every day because uh, ticket sales are low. Um, and I said that I would try to promote it to other people. But uh, man, I love uh, other people's property. Is I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, Who needs rules? Is a, is a great film. Uh, this next film is a uh, made by a filmmaker who made a film that scared the hell out of me as a kid. Uh, he was one of the directors on Late Great Planet Earth, and uh, I uh, was I saw that film halfway through and ran out in tears. I think I was like 12. <laughs> I mean, I, and uh, <clears throat> basically it was a documentary about how the world was coming to an end in my lifetime and how we were all going to die in a, uh, a nuclear holocaust. Um, and so I was freaked out pretty bad. Uh, anyways, years later, I met the director, uh, Ralph Forsberg, and I've shown a couple of his films. I've shown Stalked, and I feel like I showed um, The Parable. Uh, this is another film that he did uh, that um, it's called Ark, and it's not religious, but it is it talks about environmental issues of the day. And um, he made this film, and then a year or two later, the film Silent Running came out, which was very similar. And uh, Ralph actually, I think, sued them, uh, Universal. Uh, and I don't know if he got money or not, but it was there was some similarities here. So, anyways, this is Ark. Enjoy. When I was a child, did the old folks shake their heads and sigh? Things are different today. The summers were longer once with fragrant winds in evening. There were chimneys then and crickets. did they tell me things are different now? Once the smallmouth bass would leap from under the lotus, snapping at dragonflies. Once there were green mosses on the river stones. Why did they tell me? I understand. Goodbye. 
Hello? Yes, this is Julia. I'll be there right away. Hello. Yes, I've two of everything I can handle at the pond. No, of course I don't have whales. There simply isn't room. Well, I'm sorry too. Yes, the quails and pheasants. Ground squirrels and, and a pair of skunks. The soil aeration is perfect so far. Plenty of earthworms. Oh, and I have a pair of salamanders too. Tortoises and tadpoles. I'll have to rely on the pond for the nutrition for that. Yes, I'll do the best I can. map it out for me. As far, they'd say, as the eye could see was wilderness all around. There was a lake here then where beavers toiled and deer would drink. There were lynx, they say, and bobcats too, and wild poppies blooming. Why did they map it out that way? I'm not one for calling creatures by pet names, for sugaring the wild blood, for housebreaking the sturdy beast into a neurotic shadow of myself. I like a falcon's talons to stay sharp. The sulfur dioxide content of the air at 3.42 p.m. today is 0.42 parts per million. The lead content of the air is 6 micrograms per cubic meter. The carbon monoxide content is 28 parts per million. In the downtown area, 328 and 40 seconds, the noise pollution at the corner of Main and High Street was recorded at 90... We are of the same stuff, these creatures and I, of the same wild elements, combined in a chemistry of spit and sperm and the spirit to survive. And whether microbe or man, our relation to nature approximates that of a fish to water. Until I sealed it off in glass, this pond was dying like a waterhole in drought. But I nursed it back to health from my junkyard of pumps and paraphernalia, revived it in an iron lung of filtered air, trussed and braced it in the coils of a water distillery. Each earthworm nurtured, each life cell succored. Yet it is more much more than a puddle within a ramshackle of whitewashed glass. In this one shallow pond, I know the depth of all the salty seas. In my small pond vibrates a billion years of the birth of our vast planet, when our Earth was merely a molten lump, cooling after too much fire.
until the waters rose. water. From a holy silence, life wriggled into being. And whenever winds blew sea sprays over a cindery planet, living organisms rode on pseudopods and pogo sticks, trumpeting, here will I grow. Here will I grow. multiplied by millions, at times bizarre, but never useless. waters of life, all the rivers run back into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Into the place from where the rivers come, they return again. pond, in this small water's wet is an echo. Here will I grow. Here will I grow within this ramshackle of whitewashed glass.
I don't know where they came from, where they breed. I know only that they're destroying the life of my pond, and with it, I myself am dying in proportion. How like human beings they are in their senseless destructiveness, in their greed. Only man is more ruthless. That cloud of foul air hanging over us is the breath of human greed. And we can blame nothing else for our predicament, not even the rat. for a hungry hawk or a wise old barn owl. I'd prepared for another collecting trip to the world outside, but at the last moment I lost nerve. Somehow I'd been here too long. I'd become a kind of hothouse human. In staying, I know that I'll remain here as long as is humanly possible, using all the skills I have in rebuilding the life family of this pond, if that can be done. Perhaps the nature of a life family is too complex to control, much less synthesize. Despite many setbacks, the pond is beginning to thrive again. I want the police. Downtown area, 9.15 a.m. The noise pollution at the corner of Main and High Streets was recorded at 100 to Operator, 110. This is an emergency. Peaking at 120. This report has been recorded. The carbon monoxide content is 35. this deluge, there emerges a last man, a Noah to carry on. That Noah must be all of us. Even then the outcome is uncertain. All we know for sure is that the 40 days and 40 nights of this deluge of pollution and erosion and destruction began centuries ago. Now we are living through and dying through its last hours on this ark called 
to earth. Uh, so I was going to um, rewind it a little bit, kind of talk a little bit about somebody comment, commented on the colors were all muted, and uh, um, they're muted mostly because I was trying to color correct on the fly. So this is the color corrected version, and then this is the version pre-color correction. Um, so. Boom, boom, boom. So the colors had faded pretty significantly to uh, red. Um, so the magenta, cyan, so magenta was still there, but the cyan and the green and the blue, that was all go gone, faded. And so I can adjust the camera a little bit and the LEDs, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit to bring the red down and try to boost the other ones. Um, I can do this in software to where it gets pretty close to where it was. The thing is, I don't know, like, did he, did Forsberg, when he shot this, did he intentionally mute the colors to try to create this sense of this apocalyptic thing, like with filters and things like that? So that's the one thing that when you're talking about a restoration, a re uh, Ideally, you're going back to the film negatives, which haven't been run through a projector, and you're also talking to the cinematographer or the director to talk about what the tones of and what it was supposed to look like. Um, so that's one of the things that's kind of interesting. Sorry, I had to geek out there a little bit and uh, talk about. Uh, and so this uh, this telecine that I have is pretty great in that regard. You can do a lot of that tweaking, but there's certain things that I try to do even more where I can actually try to pull, do secondary color corrections and things. So I use a, a thing, DaVinci Resolve, which uh, allows me to do more fine um, color restoration work. Um, somebody in the comments mentioned 12 Monkeys. Uh, so I have the film that that was based on, uh, which is called Le Jetty by Chris Marker, which is another really phenomenal film. Maybe I'll Try to show that one day. I don't think that's going to bring down a copyright hammer. It's a pretty great film um, because of the way it's shot. And twelve, I was watching Twelve Monkeys when it came out, and I was like, "Wait a minute! I know this film. This is this is legit." <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's a pretty good, great film. Um, thanks everybody for tuning in today. It was great to see everybody. Uh, I'll be back again tomorrow. Um, this is, uh, for those of you that are film archivists or collectors, this is um, the week that um, of AMIA, the Association of Moving Image Archivists, that they have their conference. And if it wasn't for the pandemic, I'd be in El Paso, Texas right now, where it was supposed to take place. But thankfully, I'm not, because COVID numbers are really crazy there right now. Um, unfortunately, a lot of parts of Texas are really suffering, all over the United States, actually. So do me a favor, wear a mask. I mean, it's the simplest thing you can do. I got a haircut wearing a mask. It was fine. It was totally fine. Um, but if you like what you saw, you again, you can buy us coffee. Or better yet, you can pay for a ticket uh, and see the show that we're doing on this Saturday. 6.30, I should say that's 6.30 p.m. Central Standard Time because that's in Houston. So that's, um, yeah, I should add that. Uh, but... And also, today is not the 13th, it is the 16th. Um, all the little tiny things, and I'm all the little details I'm missing. But um, thanks again for tuning in. Always like your comments. Always like what you, 
uh, what you say and what you point out. It, it puts me in these divergent paths, which are really kind of fun. Um, you can like and subscribe and click a little icon to get notifications, depending on how you're watching this. Um, buy me coffee. And you can go to avgeeks.com and see previous shows that we've done in the past. Uh, everybody have a great rest of your uh, Monday. And as always, please rewind and love each other. Uh, we will see you again soon. Take care.